Hey, I know, weird, right? All of a sudden, I have a video, and you're watching me on my video screen. Um, as you can tell, I'm in the MFA office. And um, as you well know, I'm here to talk to you about Cache Numero Uno. Uh, the first Cache. Way to go. Um, so by now, all of you are probably either entirely freaking out that this course is not more regularly structured, or you are very thankful at the fact that this course is deliberately structured to give you quite a lot of time where I don't pop up in these weird little videos to tell you that the future is, the future is fine. Um, so, uh, each of these caches is going to be met with me giving you a lecture on, or a conversation. It's not meant to be a lecture. I'm not here to be uh, the authoritarian on the artworks that I'm presenting to you. Um, more than anything, I want you to talk, I want to talk to you about what my relationship is to these artworks. Um, and thankfully, I can now talk to you about the artworks of Mike Kelly, Ron Nagel, and Dana Schutz from a firsthand um, experience. I also have some detail shots that I'm going to show of you of their work um, that I took this past weekend when I was down in New York City. Um, and if any of you have the ability to get to New York before the close of these shows um, and you're interested in the work, you should really try to go. Um, Mike Kelly, that work's not going to be up in the public for a while because it was just around. They had a big show right around the time of his death. Um, Dana Schutz, all those paintings are going to be sold into private collections. It's going to be a long time before you see those. I've tried to find older works by Schutz, and it's really rare to see them in public collections because she is such a young artist. Uh, I, she's just a very young artist. Um, and Ron Nagel's works are intimately scaled in such a way that I don't see them really garnering that much attention at, say, at the level of an international museum. So that is all to say that going to galleries and seeing works is an incredibly important thing for you all to be doing. And that said, myself included, because I am going to do all 10 of the little reportages on seeing contemporary art, but uh, too few of you i.e. none of you have put up anything regarding contemporary art that you've seen. So that's fine. You're not behind. There were no due dates on those 10 writings. It's not like you had to have four done by this week. Um, I just paced it out so that you could kind of do it at your own pace. And um, so yeah, I would, I would start putting some stuff online. I'm going to start putting some stuff online because I want to hit all 10 and I just saw like 5 billion art shows in New York. Um, and I really, really, really want to know what you all are seeing out there in the world. I want to know how you're seeing these things. Um, not just physically, because I know two of you have had the benefit of being able to go to Venice to see the Biennale over there and probably five times as much artwork, if not 13 times as much artwork as I was able to experience in New York. So I know you're all going to be able to report back quite a lot. Um, but for those of you who are in Portland, I'm curious to know, are you going to Boston? Are you making excursions to New York? Are you making excursions five hours in the other way and going to Montreal? It's five hours both ways. Um, five hours to either New York or Montreal. Are you going someplace farther afoot? I mean, uh, to my, my students in Connecticut, are you getting down in New York City to see shows? Do you want to try and meet in New York City to see some shows at some point? I'm going to be there in later October. Maybe we could meet. Um, and to our uh, congratulations, Crystal, by the way. Uh, yay. Um, the best day of getting married is the day after you get married. Just got to say that out loud because, um, man, weddings. Whew. But anyway, uh, I know that you're in an entirely different part of the country than a lot of us have access to. Uh, although, Sarah, maybe you're going to go back and see some stuff in maybe Thanksgiving break or something. Um, 
But what are you able to see in Cleveland? What are you able to see in Cincinnati or in Detroit? I'm really curious to know what kind of artwork is drawing your attention. And um, importantly, I'm also really curious to know how you're interpreting these works. What are you seeing when you see these works of art? Are you seeing them as sculptural forms or as paintings, which is a conversation that, that Nagel puts forth? Are you seeing them as fantastical objects or are you seeing them as monikers of, say, psychological decay, as some people have read Mike Kelly's Candors? You know, are you, I'm just curious. I wanna know what you're seeing. I wanna know what you're doing. That's all. Um, so just to kind of, where are we? Um, to go over these things, um, this is gonna continue to happen uh, into the future. You know, by the time that you are seeing this, you are also seeing that there is another cache, cache number two, that has just opened for you. Um, and it's going to be the same thing, where I would like for you to discuss the works that are present. Um, in this cache number two, you're going to see that I've detailed some instructions on how to access videos, because um, certain video clips exist on artist websites that don't exist on the internet. Um, that don't exist at a high resolution, but you'll get the sense of what's going on in these videos through um, the links that I've supplied. <clears throat> um, if those links don't work, just keep hunting. And if they you bump up against a wall, shoot me an email because chances are you are not the only person having this problem. Because that's always the good thing that teachers say. You are the only dumb question is the question that's not asked. And so everyone is going to have the same problem if the link is dead, right? And if none of you tell me that the link is dead, how am I going to know, um, you know, not to write you a weird email that says, you guys didn't do this. Um, anyway, so uh, there's going to be a different selection of readings, which I really, really hope that you have been chipping away at because these ones are a lot longer. They're a lot denser and they're going to demand a lot more time on your part to unpack them. If for those of you who are more local, you want to schedule a reading group, I think that's a great idea. I might not be able to be there, but it might make more sense for the student cohort to meet and hash out some of these ideas. What the heck is Judith Butler talking about? Wait a minute. Is he or is he not a Muslim? I'm obviously not speaking about Judith Butler, right? If you don't know what I'm talking about, chances are you haven't done the readings. Um, so, uh, and then you're going to continue to do this thing where you write these short papers and, uh, and, uh, I will say that this one was the easy one. <clears throat> and from all the responses that, uh, were turned in, uh, I have to say that you all did really, really well with this first go around. Um, I was very pleased to find that so many of you had done auxiliary research either finding interviews or reviews of exhibitions that center around these artists' work. Um, so kudos to you. Uh, that, is, that is exactly the thing to do when posed with a question. Um, for the rest of your life, people are going to tell you to look at artwork. And it's going to be up to you to come up with and to find the means to come up with your own take on these artworks. So um, if you didn't get a chance to do that with this first one, it's not the end of the world. There's still a lot more to, to research on. And the connections between the artists are going to be, A, really, really instrumental and important for you to put forth. Um, I would like for you, and this is kind of a big note that a lot of you uh, are going to see on as comments on your uh, responses, um, that I am really interested in how you connect all three of these artworks. In this case, there are only three. In the next instance, there's going to be more than three, and it's going to be a varying number from here to the end. Um, and uh, so how, how are these three things related? How are the works of art related? And how are the texts at hand related? And what's going to happen is, especially as we get farther into our term, you're going to be met with a field of art practice that might not have direct relationships and it's up to you to seek out moments in the text 
and moments in the work that establish this relationship. I know that might seem like it's a big task, but this is the task of curatorial practice. This is the task of artists when they are asked to put their work in exhibition. What do you put in? What do you take out? What are you reading and how is that reading bearing on what you're producing? How is what you're reading, because all of you are going to continue to do research after this program, um, how is that going to manifest itself in the kinds of things that you, the kinds of shows that you produce, the kind of exhibitions and projects that you put forth into the world. So seeking out these establishments is very much a curatorial project, but it's also one that really helps contemporary artists come to terms with the vastness that is contemporary practice. Now, for this cache, uh, we, you all did a really great job of doing <clears throat> citing the readings. Um, but the Sledder Mice reading is the one that I think is, uh, I, I love these two readings and I love them in tandem because uh, the Sledder Mice reading, Sl Sledder Mice reading, uh, Introduction to Art as Research, is one that really talks about the breadth of human knowledge and how art history is always said, oh, well, it's psychological. Oh, it's, it's biographical. And what Sledder Mice gets at, and this is what's so important for you makers, is it doesn't actually matter so long as you present yourself as an invested party, so long as you come to master the field at hand. So if you're a ceramicist like Mr. Nagel, you have to be as best as you possibly can if you want to produce the kind of work that people like Nagel produce, which is kind of idiosyncratic challenges to uh, the, the stable of, his, of ceramics history. Um, and, you know, he talks, I'm, I'm really only going to cover this letter night, letter mice. I'm not going to really get into the Richard Schiff because Richard Schiff's conversation is really just kind of be yourself and be your researcher and understand that you are the conduit between your research and the viewer. So, if I am imaged here between my left and right hand, just think of one of those hands as being the viewer, one of those hands as being the research, and here's my big old head in the middle trying to negotiate the meaning between these two spaces. It's weird. I know. Rudimentary. I know. But hey, I'm in my office. It's at night, and I'm recording a video to myself that probably people next to me can hear. So, good thing it's the nighttime. Um, so the slutter mice, slutter, slutter, slight to mice, um, if I ever meet that man, he's going to knock me out because I have mispronounced his name so often. Um, but at the tail end of his text, he brings up three points or kind of loosely defines three points that I think are really important. One of them is don't be pedantic. If you are researching Superman, we don't necessarily need to see a lot of allusions to a guy in some tights and a cape. There's other ways to present the information without being so, so um, general that you bore your audience. So that's a really big thing. The second thing is to understand that while there are art historians like myself that might approach works of art and say, well, this is bearing on the, psycholo the psychology or the psychological makeup of the artist and it's evidencing dot, dot, dot. Or art is the purview of philosophy and is and only ever will be philosophy. What you might find, because you're the researcher and you're the artist, is that eh, those rules don't apply. That's not the case in my situation. My situation is different. And my situation is different because of these things. So essentially what Ivan says is art is in the service of no one. Art is in the service of itself. Now, we're going to go through 20th century art history over the summer, so I don't need to tell you that much about what art for art's sake is. But you have, if you have not looked up the idea of art for art's sake at this point, do yourself a favor, look that up, and it's going to be really helpful moving forward um, in the future. So, uh, art for art's sake. 
if you haven't Googled it. Now is the time. Um, and then the last thing that he says, uh, and this is the thing that is the, the link between, or as Richard Schiff says, the bridge between point A and point B, but this link between Ivan and Richard is that you as the individual artist are the person who makes the decision. It's your research, it's your life, and it's your time. And so when you look at a work of art, it's not that you're looking at the only idea that a, an artist has come out with. It, you're seeing a certain research project develop in front of you. You're seeing it in, not necessarily in their eyes, but you're seeing it, you're seeing their research presented in a very specific way. And it's up to you to use your understanding of research and art making to really bring the, uh, to bring to light the ideas at hand. Or, you know, since the artist is the view, is in here and you're, say this is you as the viewer and this is their research, you know, you're having this conversation with the artist. You're the one talking here. He's interpreting or they're interpreting this stuff and bringing it to you, but you're here. So you're an active agent in this thing as well. Um, that's you as a viewer. You as a maker are different. You're, you're the head, not the two hands. Um, weird. I'm, I'll I'll bone up on my uh, my props. My next time we'll have a lot. I'll have not put one of props for the next one. The next one's well, it's it's heavy, and I'm sure, as you all know, just by holding the texts that I've assigned for the next cachet. Uh, um, it's physically heavy in, the, in as much as it's theoretically heavy, very dense, um, and real good. <clears throat> Actually, I'll say this, um, as a little pre, uh, since most of you have already read them, one of these texts that's for the next cache is uh, my selection for papers that are written in a way that I don't want any of you to get in the habit of writing. I'm not going to tell you which one until the end, uh, until the cache closes when I give you the second video where I'll talk about actually the writing practices of all the different authors at hand. Um, so before we go into the next group of information, the, the actual slides with some details, because that's actually not going to take very long, um, I will just let you know that as a, uh, as a research course and as one of the directives that's handed down to me from this program is um, I need to get all of you kind of up to speed on how discursive writing functions and every, it's the writing that everyone hates to read because it's like the why did you put all these big words in there. Um, my response to that is you're paying a lot of money to get three letters at the end of your degree, so you may as well spend, use all that cash that you spent to get those three letters to use as many big words as possible, as often, and as casually as you possibly can. To drop a word like pedantic around a Thanksgiving dinner is evidence that you have a master's degree. Um, so, uh, I need to teach you all critical reading and writing skills. This is really focusing much more on critical reading skills and connoisseurship or kind of training your eye to see discursive practices at play. And so um, every semester, every time I run this class, I pick one reading that is problematic. Um, this semester, that reading falls within the next cache, cache. It's not to say that the reading is full of bad information. More to the point, the reading evidences a kind of writing style that is entrenched in academic discourse and is actually, I think, obtusely redundant. You might think all the readings are obtuse or all the readings are dense, or you might even think all the readings are redundant. But there's one in particular that are that is, um, it's great, it's filled with wonderful information, it could have been about 10 pages shorter, but in order to understand that and make your edits on your text in the future better, you need to read through all of these things and say, okay, 
I've now spent the last five hours reading this one text five times, and I can safely say that he said everything he needed to say, or she said everything they needed to say in the first five pages. Congratulations, I could have just read the last paragraph. But you're not going to do that yet. Do that after you graduate. While you're here, read everything, because it's great. So, um, now we're just going to kind of, I want to run through some things, show you some details. Um, because of how this videotaping system works, it's going to be a system of, actually what I'm going to do is run through the slides that I showed you, and then I'm going to flip over to um, the format of the video is going to change slightly because I have to go into a different function and show you the slides in a different fashion. So, um, Mike, Kel Mike Kelly, City 17, the, uh, the, the things in that work about that tall, the crystals. So they're pretty tall. Um, I hope you heard me when I stepped away. They're, they're fairly tall, uh, this one. They're standing on a pedestal that's about an inch larger on all sides or two inches larger on all sides. Um, but they're cylindrical, and it's in a room that is uh, a collection of about seven of these uh, city models. This is the only one where they actually appear as um, uh, kind of upside down uh, icicles. Stalagmite. No. Yeah. Yeah, they hold up. Let's see, they're mighty, right? Yeah, they're mighty. Stalagmite. Icicle stalagmites. Yeah, check that out. Earth Sciences. Um, is that one? This one is much, much, much larger. And as you can see, the canister, so that white canister that's next to it is about four feet, maybe four, four and a half feet tall. Um, so the top of the tube that connects the, can the white canister at the side with the jar encasing the can door to be um, is about my height, so it's about six foot five inches tall. So it's it, this is a massive sculpture. It's important to understand the scale here because the scale and the perfection of how it's produced says a lot about what Kelly's intent was. This appears from this distance and the, the scale that you're able to see it at as though it's kind of slapdash. It seems like it's hastily put together and might seem to be a little shoddy when you're get when you're up close and personal. That's actually not the case. What's inside of that uh, that glass, that piece of glass, and maybe oop, my window. Oop, yeah, there's a piece of glass right here. It's like a glass bottle. Um, and uh. Inside of that is the thing that is lighted and white and has all the colored icons in it, or the colored moments in it. Uh, so you have that thing in encased in its glass, and there's no gaseous substances that are going back and forth between those things. That's all fake. It not, it's, it's just fake. It just is. Um, there's nothing uh, important about what's in the, the base there. It's, it's just meant to be a base. What Kelly was interested in doing with this project was making things that seemed as though they were kind of of candor, that they were of, um, of this place that exists in his childhood memories as perfect. And as many of you pointed out, his reliance on the Superman narrative is talking about his physical and, and emotional distance from this idea of perfection. That's a problem with Superman. That's a read that a lot of people have had with Superman, is he gave people this ideal that they would never attain. And so it kind of shut them down to a certain extent, but it also put them in line. You know, if your your hope of flying around and saving the earth is diminished, you're a good factory worker. Um, that sounds kind of draconian. I'm sorry, but it's kind of the truth. Um, so, uh, the idea with the, this, the physical perfection of all of these, of all of this making is that it, it is the thing of childhood memory. Someone like Mike Kelly, his work seems so far away from people like, say, Jeff Koons, 
but both of them approach this idea of manufacturing perfection with a sense of the child in mind. Excuse me. When a child holds a balloon animal, it's perfect to them. And if you've never seen a kid hold a balloon animal, it's awesome. They're like, their eyes light up. It's, it's really a beautiful thing. And so they're there, they're looking at their beautiful thing, and they just think about all of its beautiful perfection. And then as they get older, as we get older, and we see balloon animals, they seem shoddy, they seem dumb. They, we've all tried to make them, maybe I have. It's weird. Um, it doesn't work. And so when Coons makes them huge and out of metal, he wants your reaction as a sober adult to approach these things and to have that same uh, appreciation for that which is manufactured before you. Same thing like the balloon animal. And Kelly's doing that as well. <clears throat> for him, it's really interesting. Sorry. Um, it's really interesting to have an audience that is just consumed by the narrative. They're not thinking about how it's produced. They're just thinking about how it's made. I'm sorry, that's, that, that's the same thing. They're just thinking about how perfect it is. It seems almost otherworldly how perfect it is. So I'm going to pause here. I'm going to switch to the other thing. Um, but from your seat, it's going to be just like a weird, like shuffling around. So click, click. Okay. So <clears throat> I kind of botched up my photography inside of the Kelly show. A, I'm taking pictures with the cell phone. So we all know how that goes. And B, it's really dark in there because all of the light that is coming into the space or all the light in the space is coming from the objects there. So um, what I'm trying to do in this image is not put my finger in my mouth. It's to do one of these things like, hmm, as I look down at one of the cities that's displayed on the round dials similar to um, city number two, as I, we, that was part of the cache, right? So um, this is the relationship to size and height. Uh, sorry for the wonky picture. Next one. So this is one of my favorite things to do. Um, I showed you all these at some point, I'm sure. The point of view selfie, where you actually hold the phone back behind your head and you take a picture of yourself in the, in the image looking at the work of art. Um, there's something about that loop that I find really funny. Um, I don't do it for artistic purposes. I just do it to do it. So, yeah. Um, so here I am in front of our work, right? Here it is. Uh, this is how lumino luminous this object is. So, hang on. It's kind of a weird thing. You can tell I'm using Google Slides, but I'm not going to rearrange this stuff because that'll cause me to take more minutes off, and that's obnoxious. So, um, here it is, beautifully shot for the gallery's website because this is what galleries want. This is what you see as you approach the work. But real photographers i.e. real audience members with camera phones, not a photographer, uh, are going to get this result. It's very, very bright. And so there are relations here to someone like Dan Flavin, who had an exhibition right around the corner at a gallery called David's Werner at the same time. And so you go from one moment where you're looking at a Dan Flavin installation that is entirely lit up because of the use of, say, fluorescent lights, um, not say fluorescent lights, they are fluorescent lights. So by using fluorescent lights, he's building minimalist sculptures, but he's also having the sculptural form radiate out light to imbue the entire space with the content of the work because the content of the work is light. In these instances, it's not that it's the light that's captivating you, it's the hallowed nature of it. And so we have here an artist who is very much aware of the work of Dan Flavin, but moving past it, he understands that there's going to be this radiating relationship between the sculptural object and the surrounding architecture. But rather than have that be the kind of laden idea moving forward, um, it's just an, uh, an offshoot. And Slater Nace 
brings up this conversation. Every time I say that guy's name this lecture, it's going to be a different name. Uh, whoops. Um, again, that doesn't happen to me. Uh, so what he points out is that, yes, art certainly has a lineage. But, and this is decidedly a postmodern thing, it's up to you to pay, figure out how you want to evidence that lineage. These are all industrially produced objects. The, the canister of gas, that tube, a lot of the lighting that goes in there. But Kelly is rearranging them for specific ends, specific ends towards a narrative or a poetics. Flavin was doing a very similar thing. So again, Kelly knew the history that incorporates minimalism and decided to take some of it, but not all of it. And this is something that is available to all of you as potential options moving forward. Um, I have a few more slides, because in addition to, oh yeah, ha ha, that's what it looks like up close and personal. Um, it looks like a gloppy, hot mess. Oh, uh, but when you get up close to it, you realize that it's got so much direct action. Kelly, I'm not saying that he knew exactly and had draftings of what this thing was going to look like. Quite the contrary. He allowed a certain freedom of his hand to come into play, but he also knew, had an idea in his head, what it should look like. And so while I am almost positive that there are not sketches of this object that exist, because he actually wasn't that big in, into sketching, although some things like costuming he did sketch. Um, he did know he didn't know it when he saw it and he didn't know how to make it and so um one of the things you know i said that uh kind of the end the last real important thing to take from that um art and research article is that you're responding individually well you know that annoying thing that us studio advisors have to say where it's like you don't have enough work you need to be making more work you need to make 12 of those make a hundred things this is what it means. There's probably at least 20 of these weird globes that when a light bulb is inserted into them will radiate light that looks like this. But it was having the ability to select from a variety of options that made this work such a wonderfully conclusive product, idea, project, artwork masterpiece, whatever you want to call it. It's the making of, the, of as many things as possible so that you can research and you can understand your discipline is key. And it's definitely at play here. So while certainly there's a freedom to this pouring, it's still very, very, very much part of a working practice. And so when we check back in with you, um, those of you who haven't met with studio advisors, or when I come to your studio uh, I, and I say, well, why don't you do that project again? Why don't you do that multiple times? That's what we're trying to get you to. And speaking personally, it took me, I would say, 10 performances with my town hall meeting group to really feel like I understood what it was to be in front of an audience and for me to understand what I wanted to give the audience as an agenda, as a performance, as a, as a me, as a self, as an artist. Um, and with the Institute for American Art, we're three years in and we're deliberately rearranging things because it still doesn't feel necessarily like it's doing what we want. And so this, I, this drive that I, I hope is in all of you, uh, it should be met with, with tenacity. Make a million things. Just keep making. And I, I use the word handiwork a lot, right? Handy thinking. You know, if you have a problem to solve, pour it a hundred times and figure out if you can solve that problem. If you can't solve that problem, then you have all of these different drafts that show you very empirically why you can't solve that problem with these means. Yeah, there's that whole like silly art idea that repeating something um, and thinking you're going to get the same results is, equate, is equatable to insanity. Well, 
in relationship to art, you're just making it right. And so think about it not from the case of, say, trying to open a door differently multiple times. Um, think of it like a baker. You want to test your recipes before you present them outwardly, right? Every baker is going to do that. And so bake a tray of cookies in your studio and don't show anybody that stuff. Just make 100 drawings and don't ever, I mean, show us, but they don't have to be seen by the public. That's not, that, unless you want them to. What? Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Mike Kelly's talking about Superman. What's this? In the larger room of the Mike Kelly installation, there is a very, very, very large piece of sculptural um, artwork. It kind of functions as a set. <coughs> this is one side of it. Um, with shackles. Inside of this large built thing, which I'm sure some of you are familiar with, all of you should be familiar with because all of you should have gone to the Hauser & Worth uh, website to see images of this or potentially just googled Mike Kelly Hauser & Worth to see what Flickr results come up because um, that's actually the best way to see contemporary art is through a lot of other people's eyes. But so there's this massive set that exists in the back room, and there's a, there's a movie that's being, or film, excuse me, a film that's being screened uh, at the same time. I was familiar with the, the, the screening because I saw Mike Kelly's retrospective at PS1 MoMA um, last, two years ago. But here, what they had this time was this built installation. And I'm showing you only two details because I think these two details really have a nice resonance between... Kelly's understanding of his project and how that has to take shape. So on one side, in the interior chamber of what is effectively a cave, Kelly has embedded uh, a lot of essentially tchotchke-like um, false jewelry or like theatrical jewelry. Um, this is linked to a practice that he has been had been developing for quite some time, um, which uh, is essentially as a means of establishing a memoriam for somebody who has passed, you take a variety of things that belong to them but might not necessarily be directly valuable, like say solid gold or diamonds, and you make these combines that are meant to memorialize them. Um, Oftentimes, this has been evidenced in, say, taking the top drawer of someone's desk that has a variety of coins, string, um, things that people keep dear to them that, you know, they can't ever throw out, but they just keep in that drawer. They don't have any direct value necessarily, current um, trade value, but what they do present is a memory. And so when we see these fields of jewels embedded in Mike Kelly's work, we understand that the project is about memory. To go back, we see these shackles on the outside. To have these things be essentially two sides of the same coin gives us the thesis sentence for this exhibition and for this entire project, and a lot of you hit it on the head, that what we have here is an artist who is working between the reality of a memory where somebody feels shackled, let's say, by the confines of society. They feel encumbered to present themselves as they want to present themselves. Mike Kelly was, um, he liked being eccentric. And he, that was something that was part of his biography and part of his research. Uh, oops. And then on the inside, to have that be luscious and filled with a variety of idiosyncratic collectibles evidencing a life lived in, um, within the cultural landscape. And so we have here this really nice coin, which I'm structuring as a kind of a self-portrait, but more to the point, could really be a portrait of, say, Kelly's research up to this point. If Superman is this memory of perfection, it comes then with the reality that life was not perfect. Um, just a, just a casual thesis ends. That's all. 
Uh, okay, so we're going to pause here. We're going to bounce back to the other slides. We're going to talk about next. Five o'clock shadow. That's the title of Ron Nagel's um, exhibition at Matthew Mark's gallery. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, there's this quote in the press release for this show, um, which I have all the press releases. Mike Kelly's is like several pages long, which like, you don't need to do this, Hauser and Burr. You don't. <clears throat> um, you did, so there it is. We have it now. But there's a lot of words on that press release. Matthew Marks, on the other hand, just one sheet. The way a press release should be. So <clears throat> there's this line in here, and it comes from the art critic Dave Hickey, who um, talks a lot about beauty. So if any of you are real interested in discourses of the beautiful as they relate to contemporary art, look into Dave Hickey. But he says, if Fabergé had lived in California, loved hot rods and surfboards, and had been blessed with an impudent art historical wit, on his best day, he couldn't compete with Nagel. Hickey is talking about Fabergé, who is by all accounts, one of the world's most nuanced and delicate manufacturer of fine things. Ceramics included in that, very heavily included in that with the Fabergé eggs, as we all know, but there was a lot of other things that the industry of Fabergé put forth. Um, but as a designer, he really did work um, with ceramics quite heavily. And um, these, It's, how do I say this? Holy shit is probably the best way for me to describe these works of art. Holy shit. Um, the one thing I forgot to get <clears throat> from my own perspective for you is an installation view of these works because the installation of these works is also killer. Every single one of these things is can, can pretty much sit on the surface of my cell phone. Probably fill it up pretty well. But they're so tiny. They're so tiny. See little little guys, only about that tall. Some some of the bigger ones are about that big, but not much bigger. Super little, super intimate, super one to one. And the way that Matthew Mark's gallery decided to install these works was to build a false wall that was about say that far to that far off of the real wall, cut little tiny windows into that wall and seat these sculptures behind it, putting a piece of glass before it and you. So every one of these things that you see, you see behind glass, which A, makes you think that they're valuable, B, makes you not spit on them or breathe on them or knock them over, um, and C, it keeps them almost entirely clear of dust. These things, have some of the craziest surfaces that I have seen in ceramics in my life. Whoa! That said, I have not done my due diligence in looking at the surfaces of ceramics as much as I have the surfaces of painting or the surfaces of sculpture. Um, so that on that, my bad. But um, one of the things that needs to be said is that like I, this guy just understands so much about the process. He understands so much about glazing, about firing, about form, about composition. If any of the artists here are should be kind of um, hallmarks for a direction that I wish all of you the best of luck finding your way down, it would be this man. Holy shit. Um, so Ryder's sky, uh, if you the when in the moments that you can, there's not that many of them, but in the moments that you can get around and just kind of see under, you realize that this isn't a matter of firing multiple pieces and assembling them. 
these are actually all one piece, one solid piece, at least to the, uh, the ones that I was able to get close enough to inspect. So he is forming all of these as one piece, glazing them, firing, and so it, they, they are cohesive compositions. This isn't assemblage. This isn't collage. This is formalism. And it's formalism, a word that I'm very comfortable using, employed in a way that I'm not that comfortable seeing, or I'm not, it's not that, I haven't seen that much work that really has this kind of resonance. There's been a lot, a lot, a lot of headway made in the field of contemporary ceramics. There have been so many really instrumental makers out there in the world right now to bring fine art practice more comfortably into the conversation with ceramics and to bring ceramics more comfortably into the conversation with fine arts, the fine arts. This is the same uphill battle that was fought by Stieglitz with regard to photography at the beginning of the last century. Will ceramics be at the place where photography is um, or was in 1999, let's say, by the 2099? Uh, I don't know. Hopefully, if this kind of work continues to bubble up, then yes, we have a very good likelihood that we are going to see a lot more exhibitions of ceramics at a museum level um, and not kind of quieter, smaller uh, craft museum um, exhibitions. So these things are just, just insane. I've, I've seen Nagel's work reproduced. It, I mean, it, I'm, I actually am speechless. I am speechless before these objects. They are just so, so crazy. Um, this is the one that you got the ability to kind of see around because I was convinced, convinced when I assigned the, this work that this was assemblage, that this was a meticulous understanding of ceramics so as to make multiple pieces that fit beautifully and quasi seamlessly within one another. And arguably, I could still be wrong. Maybe these are assemblages. Maybe my read of them is totally wrong because he's been able to fool my eye and think that my connoisseur's eye is actually incorrect. But I don't think that's the case. Um, because, man, whoa. Um, so yeah, this one is the one that you can see underneath of it. You, this is that green fold of hunter green and kind of rich, rich, rich. It's probably actually a black glaze that he's let slide a little bit into the spectrum of its base color. Um, if glazes work similar to dyes, I'm actually not a ceramicist. I've never done that, that field, uh, which makes me totally, um, it's stupid that I'm talking to you about these things. Like I know what I'm talking about because I'm sure the ceramicists that are listening are just like, no, Chris, that's different, different chemicals, different chemicals, different thing, different thing entirely. Um, sorry if I am wrong there, but, uh, if, if whatever, the top of this reads more green, the, the, the falling down aspect, that which comes around that um, neon colored asteroid, it, it, trend, it moves into a blacker moment is the easiest way to say that. So it's greener on top and moves in this blacker moment. That field of white, that little halo of white in the background is actually straight up flat. Um, and so not only is this uh, uh, kind of this mashup of different surface textures and glazing techniques, it's also deliberately a sculptural play where so much of ceramics is reliant on the viewer understanding what they're looking at. I mean, there's, a, there's fields of, of ceramics that are entrenched in making objects that are linked to use value but don't exhibit it. So say, artistically produced teapots. There's a whole field of them. Um, and you're supposed to see these things in the round, but it's always supposed to bear some sort of a relationship to th something you know. Oh, I've held a teapot, so I can see how the ceramicist has made some crazy things with this teapot. Um, 
And uh, Nagel, on the other hand, is not interested in the use side of the conversation, but he's really, really interested in that ceramics craft conversation. How did he do that? And so he really makes these, th these little sculptures that he refers to, as a few of you pointed out, as uh, three-dimensional paintings, which is a beautiful way to talk about them because tonality and color and form are all here and all have such a strong relationship to one another, um, which is obviously part of ceramics culture, but uh, has much more of a vocabulary in painting. Um, but he brings all of these things together and really just gives you this wonderful sculptural mystery. And um, to the point that by the time I got around to seeing uh, the sketches, the sketches were great. And a few of you pointed out that they uh, had tethers or, or kind of appear to be the more saleable side of the room. Um, I'm not going to discount that, but I will say that they, I spent like three seconds in front of each of these things because I knew the more time I was looking at those, the, le the less time I was looking at these. And when I'm running around seeing a million galleries in five hours, I got to see the things that I really want to put in my brain. And these things are things I want to put in my brain. Man. Whoa. Um, all right. So again, I'm going to pause here. We're going to flip back to the other slides and we're going to wrap this up in probably just over an hour. Hang tight. Those two little legs that just stick out. <laughs> I mean, it just, he's got such a sense of humor. He's so willing to play with that sense of humor. He's so willing to, um, to <clears throat> make work that is weird, to make work that is idiosyncratic, to make work that only he and his weird intellect and his weird interests can manifest that's something that's really, really important. And that's something that I think some of you hit on, but the the thing that Richard Schiff talks about is kind of owning, owning your intermediary role. <clears throat> there's always going to exist an audience and there's always going to exist ideas. And as an artist, as this is what something that almost all of you pointed out, is that the artist becomes the bridge, as they said, between this one and this one. And the thing about metaphor and the thing about individuality <clears throat> and the thing about you being the person who's doing the research and you being the person to present that research is that you get the opportunity to just be yourself. You get the opportunity to, I'm, I'm sitting here in front of this thing because I want to sit here in front of this thing because I know this will be kind of familiar for a lot of you. you I know that this thing makes me so happy for so many other reasons. Um, and, uh, and so as that intermediary, you get to make all of the decisions. And one of the decisions that Nagel made, and it's also one of the decisions that Kelly made, and it's also one of the decisions that Schutz made, is that you can just be a little bit of an idiosyncratic weirdo. And not to say that that's the way to be an artist, because I'm sure more than one of you is listening to this lecture and you're like, well, duh, I'm an artist. I'm obviously a weirdo. There's a lot of artists out there that are not weirdos. There's a lot of artists out there that are bookish nerds that apply, that stick to the rules and color in the lines. Because as we're going to talk about next semester, the art world is huge, varied, and vast, and wonderful, and wonderful, wonderful, wonderful in its ability to give us as many options as we have. But Nagel and these folks are really privileging a weirdness, a weirdness that is certainly something of a period style, this kind of awkward relationship to surrealism, let's say, um, awkward relationship to narrative and, uh, and fiction, and mo most directly. But the thing that Nagel gets at is this silliness, and this silliness is just like, it warms my heart. There was something that's so approachable about these projects, these little sculptures. You feel like you just want to take care of them. Now, I've been in a lot of spaces with a lot of Fabergé eggs, and I'm scared to death 
to be around those things. I just feel like they're so they're so perfect and nuanced and gilded that I feel as though my my like you know working class hands are too dirty to touch. But my working class hands are working class weirdo hands. And so these things I really want to touch. I want to touch in so many different ways. And one of the only ways, obviously the only way that I've touched these things other than psychically is with my eyes, is that kind of the, the psychic looking and the, the feel of these things. So the textures are really, really important. And the way that they're manifested is important. Nagel knows you want to touch these things. He knows that you want to feel the difference between that really polished um, blob on the edge of what appears to be almost like a bed. Um, he wants you to see, and he wants you to try and want it like, I want to know, do those little pink things move? Are they, are they stuck? I mean, I know that they're actually fired altogether because I just made that conversation before, but how does the feeling of those things relate to the thing in the background? Um, are they deliberately supposed to be read as sexual? Is this supposed to be kind of a coitus bed? Um, or is it supposed to be a goofy or an allusion to a face? Because that was the friend that I was walking around these galleries with said, oh, that one reminds me of a face. You know, an upper lip potentially with a red blobby mustache, a lower lip of just the same coarse material that makes up the rest of the face, and then these two eyes that drape down. I'd never seen that face, but I laughed really hard when he told me that he saw a face, because there's kind of a face. All right, so there's my friend Ben. Um, we're both looking at the sculpture. Uh, he, I'm doing the same thing. I'm just like, I, I, oh, right, I got to get these pictures for my students. And so um, I, I, there I am, camera behind my head, hold my, hmm, hmm. Hmm. Interesting. Now, what you can see here is that this is actually the work of art that was in uh, in the cachet, right? Uh, and so here you have, and um, if you want to, you can kind of. I don't. I don't have a zoom function uh, on here. Unless I wonder if it's going to work. I've never done this with this computer. Oh, oh, oh! oh. I ruined it. Okay, that's as big as I can get it. Sorry. Um, so that's the scale that we're dealing with. Uh, this is obviously the presentation that is not behind the wall. The wall, the one behind the wall, this is what it looks like. So it's got this kind of like dull, uniform light that illuminates it. Um, but these are seated on vitrines. But again, they are you know, under glass, so they're they're dustless. Um, now, what what is this? Uh, this is a comparator to Nagel, and this, when I saw the Nagel work, my first thought was, oh, Ken Price. Um, and so, uh, you know, here, th this was at the, uh, Matthew Marks has a variety of different spa um, gallery spaces. One had this show in it, and next door, they had a work by Ken Price, uh, this being this. And um, I will say that the, its relationship to a mouth or to some other orifice on the body was part of the reason why I took this picture because as you walked into this room, this was the only object seated on a pedestal. And so very similar to this, where you have the ability to walk in three dimensions, I thought it very telling that Matthew Marks made you walk into a space where you're confronted by this um, thing kind of opening up or shouting out at you. It's the, Ken Price's uh, ceramic-based sculptures are also really incredible and worth checking out if you were interested in Ron Nagel. Um, and that can no, disregard that. Um, so I'm going to pause. We're going to go back and we're going to get to Dana Schutz and then we're going to wrap this thing up. That was a really loud clap. Fight in an elevator two. Fight in an elevator. Fight in an elevator. Fight in an elevator. Hang on.
Oh, fighting an elevator. Fighting an elevator. How come none of you thought to go to that? Um, let me move this thing back over. Not that you have to think about going to that. Oop, oop, oop. I guess I have to pause. Hang on. Um, not that you immediately had to go to the most pop cultural reference that there is about two people fighting in an elevator, um, but I personally, it didn't read as an accident that we have a very young contemporary artist who not only has uh, two works in an exhibition titled Fight in an Elevator, but decides to call the exhibition as a whole Fight in an Elevator. Um, whether or not there's other allusions to fights or elevators, and a few of you made really good conjectures as to potentially what that could be, something horrifying, because um, uh, elevators are are in just essence kind of deeply horrifying, and at the same time, fights are, I'm not a fighter, I'm not really interested in that kind of thing, so um, also horrifying, but I, when, if thinking about like, Richard Schiff's conversation of like you being the researcher and you as the researcher open up these new ideas and bring your audience into certain reads. For me, I was just like, holy crap, here's one of the most important uh, contemporary painters today who's making work that is titled and in homage to this pop cultural event. Um, and of course, this isn't just kind of a love song to Solange or to Beyonce or to Jay-Z. Uh, what I think she's more interested in is identifying that moment, that fight in the elevator, where we saw people who have perfect, perfect cultural presentations, right? That's the one thing about those superstar that that those specific superstars is that they have such a tight hold on how the public sees them that to have a fight in an elevator something that's so visceral and so so just angsty I mean you have the sister you have a sister punching her brother-in-law kicking her brother-in-law she's restrained and she is still kicking at her brother-in-law a family feud gives those three celebrities, a bit of humanness that relates them to people. It makes us say, even though I've never gotten into a fight in an elevator, that I could. I mean, I could totally get into a fight in an elevator. Uh, don't, don't get into fights in an elevator, right? Um, but this idea that there, that this kind of violence, this, this action can open up a certain level of honesty is I think how Dana Schutz approaches the, her entire practice as a painter. What she's interested in doing is showing you the reality of paint. She's very, very much a modern painter. She's very interested in the action or the gesture of putting pigment down on a flat surface with a brush. Um, she does it in a variety of ways in this exhibition. She does it in a variety of compositions in this exhibition. But each one feels a bit like a violent act, but a violent act between family members. Dana Schutz is in a family with painting, much like Solange is in a family with Jay-Z. And so her violences, her punches, they're authoritative, they're aggressive, they want to hurt you, but they don't want to damage you. They don't want you to feel scarred by what you've seen but they certainly want to make sure that you are aware of the physical reality that exists in those kinds of interactions. So yeah, I did just say Beyonce, Jay-Z, and Solange in a graduate school seminar, and who would have thought that was going to be the case? But here we are, and this is how it's happening. So um, I've got a few of these slides that we can just click through because I want to... Darn. Um, Swiss family traveling... So, okay, the fight in the elevator thing, that's that's perfection, humanity, da, da 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 What about this? If any of you have ever seen a Swiss family traveling, talk about a mark of perfection that has these subtle nuances of humanity creeping up. Swiss families, right, we've got a lot of them in our cultural history, always have presented in our cultural history um, a level of understanding, a level of perfection, a level of order. The Swiss are a very, very ordered people. They're a very diligent people. 
ask people who know Swiss people. They're really direct. They're really pulled together. But whenever anyone of, that is a human is traveling, their humanity comes out. We smell gross when we're traveling. We feel gross when we're traveling. We're lost. We're confused. We're pissed off at every person that's around us. But we're also kind of tantalizingly excited by all the things that are in our midst. So there's this kind of disconnect, reconnect thing that happens. You're kind of constantly pushed out of your body and then brought back in. Pushed out of your body and then brought back in. And so this back and forth happens much like fisticuffs in an elevator. Now, um, so with these two things, we're going to pause. I'm going to flip back to the other format, basically my Dropbox, um, and talk about the rest. All right, so um, same old thing. Me getting myself in there. Um, it's just basically me saying, like, hi, guys, I'm in this room with this painting. Um, so there's that. But then I just have a lot of close-ups. And um, I understand that I talk a lot about painting because painting is my uh, the discipline that I've studied for so long. Um, but I'm, I'm doing as much as I possibly can to give myself a vocabulary and a means for talking about other things. So I'm working on it. Um, as I hope all of you are, but I am going to dork out here on painting. So all of you keep in mind that this is how people who are really interested in what you talk about talk about your work, because what we're seeing here is a close-up detail, and there's just basically a bunch of details that I'm going to walk you through um, to show you that what Schutz is interested in doing, and they're horrible cell phone sculpt uh, pictures, I get it, uh, but what Schutz is interested in doing in presenting, like I said, that humanity uh, or the physicality, the physical truth of painting um, is she's going to use a lot of different ways to make her mark. So we're going to see um, oil crayon, which is the red squiggle here. We're going to see a kind of water, um, a more liquid form of oil, uh, probably just really um, watered down uh, oil that makes that larger blue gesture. But then there's a more attentive focus to the brushwork in the that um, shape of blue, white, and red, which is a beach ball. It looks like a beach ball, right? It's a beach ball. So um, here's another moment. This is actually the scalp of a person. Um, and you can see that there's absolutely no regard to the physical truth of human flesh. Instead, there's an interest in just having a multiplicity of painterly gestures coming together to present painting as a physical reality more than this narrative that, they're, that the work is trying to put forth. So again, thinking back to the Jay-Z met, uh, metaphor, the, the, the Solange metaphor, um, that moment, that tussle in the elevator evidenced humanity in the same way that these little moments inside of these paintings evidence an earnest um, uh, corporeality to the painting. This is Fight in an Elevator 1, um, in which the, and this is why I related it to the Jay-Z scene, because um, in this one we have a variety of um, are basically people of color who are in this fight. And so when I first saw that image, I, I immediately went to that and was like, oh, it's that. And then saw a variety of different things and came to my own conclusions about what I think that title um, evidences, as I've made clear. But again, we have the illusion, the very um, earnest, direct presentation of a foot in a high heel. But the way that high heel is presented, the marks, the color, the gesture, so good. Um, damn. So uh, I, I've talked about the popularity of abstract painting before. Um, within the last few years, gestural abstraction has really had a moment of, of coming back, um, so much so that it's referred to as kind of zombie formalism. Uh, to deride the work of many artists in two um, mean words. Uh, this is this this little clip of one moment in her painting 
is what a lot of zombie formalist work looks like. So Schutz is doing the research that she needs to do to keep herself invested in this discipline. She's going to shows, she's going to museums, she's talking to curators, she's reading magazines. She is doing the, the research that Sledermeis puts forth. Like, you have to be a participant in this field. You pick the field, but you gotta be a participant in a field. You gotta pick something. Um, and for all three of these artists, that field is really directly showing and making work for the museum, or for the gallery, and for the collector. So th if that's not your art world and this isn't your world, then that's fine. But you got to be, be a participant in some world. Um, so like these moments are, I've seen entire painting shows that look like these moments. And the fact that these are encompassed in larger narratives that are all equally and energetically painted, that are all cohesive and beautifully finished works of art, um, is just a mark of an, of, a, of an artist who was really attentive to everything. I'm not going to make a, a mark on this canvas unless it means something. I'm not going to move forward with glazing part of this, and this is Nagel's thought, if I'm not thinking it for a very specific reason. And Kelly was just as much of a for, had much, just as much foresight in the production of his works as I talked about with his multiple casts of um, the one thing that ended up being shown. Ugh, gosh. Um, and uh, that's kind of all I've got. Um, I kind of walked through some of the text. I walked through what I was imagining with these things. Um, and I will say that uh, I'm happy that we got, we're, the ball is rolling, y'all. Um, so what I'm going to anticipate from you in the next few weeks is uh, a, there's got to be an uptick because if none, of, no one's done any of them, um, the first person that does one is going to be evidence of an uptick. Uh, go and see contemporary art and report back to us all what you are seeing. Um, hang on, actually. All right, just to put it here so that it's here at the end to say goodbye. You have homework. Do it now. Um, Ten times over the course of the semester, you are to report on the art that you have seen during the course of this semester. Um, I say the word semester twice. Don't ever do that, um, bad professor. Uh, you must see this work in person. So go out and see art. This means that you have to go and see art. See? Um, and then I give you this little rundown. So for those of you who are coming back from Venice, you can write a review of one uh, pavilion, a review of another pavilion, a review of another pavilion, and that'll count for three. If you are going to New York City and you go to Matthew Marks Gallery, Hauser and Wirth Gallery, and, um, oh my God, Petzl Gallery, you can write three different reviews. If you go to a, the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, and you go into the 18th century room, you go into the 19th century room, and you go into the 20th century room, you can break those apart and talk about them in three different things. So this isn't a demand that you have to go and travel around the world to see artworks. It's actually trying to get you in the habit, in the practice, because that's what this is all about, developing a professional practice, um, to get you in the practice of going and seeing artworks in person in situ because they're really really important so um go into a gallery space take notes on lots of different aspects of them um uh publish one of these accounts on the web at a time and then you know include more things show send me the send me to the gallery um especially those of you who are reporting on things that are not immediately in portland um i want to know what you're seeing i want to know how you're seeing it and more than anything, I'm going to be really curious to hear how it relates to your practice, how it relates to your research, um, because what you're doing in this second semester of your graduate degree program is honing in on what your research is actually going to be. There's a lot of pressure in these readings to have one specific kind of thing. And 
one of the things that I can say is even though it's difficult to get through these texts, when you're done with them, if they're not part of your research or part of your practice, you are done with them. You put them down and you move on. And at fifteen min, uh, one hour and 15 minutes, I am signing off and I am looking forward to hearing much more from all of you about what you see. So on that note, peace out.